Here in your ICND-1 studies, your CSENT studies, you get a little taste of spanning tree protocol, which is what we're about to do, and you're probably breathing a sigh of relief thinking, good, because we got enough to do. And that's true. And in ICND-2, you really learn a lot of details and commands about STP, but it is important for you to know why we have STP in the first place, why we usually just leave it alone, because uh, it works really, really well just straight out of the box. It doesn't need a lot of fine tuning in a small to medium network. The reason that we need it is because of redundancy. And you would say, well, you've been saying redundancy is a good thing for the last couple of hours. And it is. You know, because redundancy, it's just a fancy way of saying we have a backup plan. And we'll take as many of those as we can get, but especially when it comes to our paths. And whether we're dealing with switching or routing, we always want a redundant path between any given two points because what's that thing we're always trying to avoid? That single point of failure. You hardly even hear about that anymore because we've got so many great tools to avoid it. Uh, but years ago, it's just you heard about it all the time. You know, this is our single point of failure. If the switch goes down, the whole network goes down. Well, obviously, that is not acceptable in today's networks. So what we have is something like this. We could have a switched network set up where there are multiple paths for any one host to get to another host. So if one switch goes down, and perhaps even two switches go down, we still would have paths for these hosts to send each other data. And right now, we've got several possibilities to go just from A to D. You know, we've got five different ones. I'm not going to read them all there. But we have five different paths. So if switch two or switch four goes down, our center of the network switches, frames could still be sent between the four hosts. Let's just assume that switch two is accidentally powered down. You know, stuff happens. So if that one's removed, these four hosts can still send uh, data to each other. There's no problem. And on top of that, even if switch four went down, in addition to switch two, the link between one and three would be enough to allow the host to send frames to each other. And that's a lot of redundancy. If you lose two switches and everything's still good, then you, know, you, you have a very redundant network. As you've already noticed, in networking, we have a lot of trade-offs. You know, you learn about a protocol, you learn about a feature, and you learn about all these benefits, and then I say, but you have to watch out for this. You know, they're always uh, a, a little bit of a negative, maybe. Well, believe it or not, there's actually a little bit of a negative to go along with having this kind of switch network, because what we could end up with is something called a switching loop. And again, the good news is we have redundancy. We have multiple paths between hosts on, e on either side of the switches. The bad news is the same as the good news because this also gives us the possibility of switching loops. Now, a switching loop forms when a frame is transmitted and it ends up being sent back and forth between the same switches. It could just be sent between you know, switch A and switch B. It could go A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, like the one I've got here, I believe, or 142, 142, actually. And fortunately, this doesn't happen very often because unlike routing loops, because keep those terms straight in your head, too. Don't see the word loops on an exam question and jump to the conclusion. Now they're talking about switching loops. We have switching loop possibilities, and we have routing loop possibilities. Routing loops, frankly, are usually almost always caused, I should say, by a, a misconfiguration. Uh, someone's fine-tuning a path, they don't realize something, and all of a sudden they have a switching loop. But at layer two, switching loops, excuse me, routing loops, switching loops can happen because of a corrupt MAC table. Again, doesn't happen very often. Uh, duplicate MAC addresses on network hosts, you know, because we've got programmable cards. Uh, again, that's a man-made problem, so if you're not doing a lot of that, you shouldn't run into it. Or destination hosts just being unavailable. You know, these aren't common, but they do happen. And a switching loop looks just like this, and this is the kind of thing that can happen. Host A sends a frame for host D. Switch 1 gets it, says, you know, the best next switch for to get this is switch 4. That'll get it closer to its destination. Switch 4 looks in its MAC address table and says, okay, we should send this up here to switch 2. Switch 2 gets the frame, looks in its MAC table, and said, OK, the best place to send this is to switch 1. And the process continues. And it just continues and continues and continues. And that's the kind of thing we've got to avoid. Because again, we're, we're on a logical loop. The frame never gets to its destination. And that, my friends, is why we have the spanning tree protocol. 
Cisco switches use STP to prevent switching loops. STP is a layer two protocol. It has nothing to do with routing loops, strictly a switching loop prevention tool. And again, you're gonna learn a lot more about configuring STP and working with it in your ICND2 studies, but we're going over the fundamentals here. What happens is, is that STP determines a loop-free path for frames, and ports that are not on that path are put into blocking mode. So just, that, just because we have all these available paths, it doesn't mean we're going to use them. STP is going to pick the best path and it's gonna open the ports along that path. Then the other ports are gonna be put into blocking mode. Now, of course, what happens if that best path goes down? Well, STP realizes that, recalculates its port costs, it determines the new best path and then brings ports along that path out of blocking mode. That is not instantaneous. And the reason it's not instantaneous is that, let's say that you had a flapping port somewhere, and a port goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. Well, if the cutover to new ports was immediate, then you really could end up with switching loops. STP is kind of patient in saying, okay, you know, I think there's a problem, let's start the process of opening up some other ports. Now, that delay can drive us a little crazy as network admins because we'd like the cutover to be immediate, but there's a reason that it's not. And again, if it were immediate, that itself could lead to switching loops. Uh, one thing I'll mention here, and I'll mention it in the ICND2 course as well, don't assume that the physically shortest path from A to B is the path that STP will choose as best. Because what STP does, it looks at the port speeds along a path to determine the overall cost and the best paths. So it's not, it's not like RIP, you know, it's not counting hops, you know, hippity hops or something like that. It's actually looking at port values like speed and saying, okay, we're gonna use speed to calculate the path costs and then we'll determine the best costs. Costs, that is. Again, this is strictly an overview of STP. You're gonna learn a lot more about it in your NA and your NP switching studies but now you know what a switching loop looks like, you know a couple of reasons it could happen, you know what STP's primary purpose is, and an overview of how that happens. Uh, again, STP is on by default, and there's really no good reason to ever try to go in and turn STP off, because it works so beautifully, it's like one of those things that we never give a second thought to. We don't really worry about switching loops that often, because STP does such a great job of eliminating them. And that is it for your overview of STP, but we've got some more switching videos for you, and I'll see you on the next one.